Chester office, but he represents um, Delaware and parts of Chester County, the surrounding areas. So he's going to talk to you about um, Social Security and all the things that you need to know um, when you're thinking about retirement, um, and how it relates to your retirement from here and things like that. So, thank you. Good afternoon. Yes, my name is Ed Lafferty, Public Affairs Specialist for Social Security. This guy, let me preface it, this is going to be informal, so I have a PowerPoint. It'll last about an hour and 15 minutes. We get a lot of questions, it could last longer. But uh, it, please feel free to ask during the presentation. You don't have to wait until the very end to ask what the guy asked or say or mention or comment and respond to an hour ago. Uh, I'll introduce this as our uh, website, www.socialsecurity.gov. Has everybody been there or have you visited it? For those of you who have not, this is the real key. Go there. Everything I'm going to talk about is basically on the website and far, far more. So all of the information. I bought several handouts on uh, when to start receiving retirement benefits, how your retirement benefits figured, understanding the benefits, how work affects your benefits, and a bookmark with these two personages touting what is available online. We're going to talk about these things and answer your questions today, but the real key is go online. Uh, about 56 million people are on Social Security, almost one out of every six, with the increase in the number of individuals who are actually filing for retirement these days, today, and in the near future. Um, actually, more than the near future, it's going to be for the next generation. We're going to have something like 80 million people on Social Security, one out of every five. So much of the information that we're going to be going over, you can get much greater detail here. Um, and yes, it is George Takei from Star Trek. It is Patty Duke, who never appeared in Star Trek, to the best of my knowledge. But she does look good in power blue. They are our celebrity <laughs> science persons, in case you wondered about going to Social Security. Again, Social Security, Retirement, and you. We're going to be talking about several things in terms of retirement. That's the real focus. You're filing for retirement benefits. What I'm going to be discussing, what you should know before you file for retirement, what you need to know after you file for retirement. We're going to talk about family benefits, mostly about spouses, current spouses, someone you're currently married to, divorced spouses, but also a little bit about widows and widows, survivors benefits. I'm going to spend a few slides on how work affects your benefits. It's particularly important for someone who is filing for benefits and thinking in the future, should I be working? So what the criteria are, which you should be considering. We're going to touch a little bit on Medicare. I want to preface the comments, though, on Medicare with this, that you enroll with Social Security for Medicare, but Medicare actually is covered by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, it's a completely different federal agency. They handle the kinds of questions such as durable medical goods, what's in the formulary for the prescription drug program, questions about providers. We don't touch any of that. We enroll you. Uh, the Premiums are withheld from your benefit. Other issues that might come up similar to that or in those categories we talk about, and as I say, we do enroll you, but in terms of what Medicare is about, <coughs> who's covered and how, you would want to go to the Medicare website, and I have a couple slides on it, and Medicare is www.medicare.gov. So we're talking a little bit about Medicare, but that's uh, not the main focus. But definitely is part of the retirement plan. This is just very basic because it comes up again and again, how do you qualify for retirement benefits? In order for someone to receive a retirement benefit from Social Security, someone has to have worked enough to have earned 40 credits, 10 years of work. Now the 40 credits for retirement, you'll notice, are it's a dollar amount every year, the amount, typically every year, the amount goes up. This year it's $1,130. 2012, you earn a credit. The maximum you can have in a, a year is four. So in terms of 40 credits, 10 years of work. And that's all that it means. It doesn't say how much you'll receive, when you receive it, or so forth. All we're talking about here is there's a threshold. If you have 39 credits, you haven't earned enough to get a cash benefit from Social Security. Once you have 40 credits, you're now due a benefit. How much is going to depend on various factors, but this is just a threshold to say, I've met that, and this is why oftentimes you'll hear, you need 10 years of work, 40 credits. 
Once again, this goes to what our website looks like, www.socialsecurity.gov, our home page. Suggest you go visit it. It is your tax money at work. So it has lots of links, you'll notice, the entire page. It's a busy page. And one of the points about filing for retirement is what are the right questions to be asking before you even make the decisions? It's easy to say just go online, but what does that mean? And so a suggestion I'm offering is please feel free, this is yours, to look at, but go to retirement in, in the top corner of that rectangle. If you click that, yes, that is Patty Duke again. This time this is where she applied in her flannel pajamas. I'm not sure what criteria, how that uh, makes it easier, but you too can file in flannel. Actually, I'm going to use that phrase, file in flannel, from now on in presentation. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it. Okay. So it, it goes through a range of in, issues and information you can get, so you can use that as a, a base to work from. But as a launch pad, go to use our retirement planner. Now the retirement planner gives you quite a bit of information about planning for retirement. There are demonstrations, you have more links here, calculators, and so forth. The one I'd like you to focus on is near retirement with a question mark. And by the way, you can put this up in the search engine up in the upper right hand corner. I'm just going through retirement, retirement planner, near retirement with a question mark to introduce you to some of these pages. But if you go to near retirement with a question mark, what do you have? It's just a page full of links. But all of the links basically cover something like 90, 95% of those <coughs> questions you would typically think to be asking. Ones that you should be thinking, or if you haven't thought about it, perhaps it triggers it. There's a retirement estimator you can click to, work and benefits, how that affects you, and that we're going to talk about that, spouse's benefits, children's benefits, late retirement credits, government pension offices, all of it is here. And so my suggestion is go here first, look at the links. Links will take you to other links. One of the important things is these are the kinds of topics that are important because it's hard to know ahead of time, what should I be asking before you even get the answers to something. And so all of this is here, it's all available, near retirement with a question mark. For example, if you had clicked the retirement estimator, retirement estimator allows you to do what if scenarios. In the past, and there, the statement that went out would list all of your earnings, detail each year. It would tell you how much you would be receiving from Social Security at certain ages, 62, 60 full retirement age, we're going to talk about that in 70. But it makes several assumptions. It assumes you're continuing to work and that the amount of your most recent earnings continues. Well, those might not be the cases. So you're being given numbers that apply in a perfect scenario. If you continue to do this in the same manner, this is what you receive. The estimator allows you to go online. It actually uses your earnings record. It doesn't show all the years. It, it, follows a series of prompts identifying you. It'll get your earnings record, your social security number, and then you can do what if scenarios, such as what if I stop work at 58 and I don't work at all? What impact would it have? For some people who have lost jobs where they've had to retrench and are not make earning as much, what impact does it have on social security? What if I make more money? What if you left and you're making much more? What impact does it have on my monthly social security benefit? Retirement estimator allows you to do all of that. And it's not a permanent uh, estimator in the sense that you can't affect your earnings record. It is just using the base information there. You're applying a scenario. Once you're off the browser, it's done. You don't affect anything, so it's perfectly safe. It's secure, but it gives you the opportunity to make different come up with questions because we get this all the time. Well, what if I stop working now? What if I don't stop working? What if I make more or less? Because these issues on one triggers another and another and another. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah, what's the uh, what's the perception of near retirement? <laughs> one year, three year, five years? Well, in fact, you mean for the retirement estimator? Almost anyone can use yeah, it. Let me just say, when you say click the near retirement, question mark. Okay. Near retirement, the question mark is just a title. Okay. It could be far from retirement, and you would still use it. <laughs> Close okay. to retirement or retirement. The near retirement really is for someone, well, we don't want to make assumptions for most of the people in here, but if you're closing in on those years, if you're in that, I'll oh, say, 50s demographic, 
and soon to be into the 60s, or you're actually into the 60s, you're close enough that it, it's much more meaningful because now you have to plan for it. It's good for someone who's, who can use that uh, same page for, and this page, in fact, is perfect for someone well before retirement. In other words, giving an estimate of what do I do if I earn this or such and such. What if I change? But most of the time we're talking to people who are within, say, a decade. But that's a round number because it depends on who you are. There are people who at 45 want to know immediately, people at 35, and people don't want to know until they're two months away from Social Security filing. Those are the people we really would like to see this earlier. So near retirement has no magical number on that in that sense. But if you do the retirement estimator, it gives all of this data. And you can print it out. And it says, oh, this is, if you wait, this is how much you get. There's age 70 of 62. But it has other assumptions that it's building in. And once again, you'll notice all of these links. The website has this redundancy factor built in. You don't go very far before you get a lot of links, and many of which will say, I thought that was on another page and another one. And the idea is to make it easy <coughs> access for anyone to get to wherever they need to get. And that's why you have this. So you go to the retirement estimator, you get the amount, but how are retirement benefits figured? Now, I have a handout over there that goes into detail. On our website, it goes into much more detail, quite a bit. So if you're interested in really finding out down to the penny what an average index monthly earnings is or a primary insurance amount, etc., other phrases, other acronyms, please feel free. You can do this. The simplest point is we adjust wages for changes in wage levels. In other words, your wages across your work history compared to national change in wage levels, changes in your wage levels taking into account that what you made 20 years ago, the flat numbers are not the same because of inflation, because of wage increases. So those changes are reflected through a formula that's on the uh, handout. We average it over most of your working lifetime. We're talking the highest 35 years. Social Security uses for everyone the highest 35 years. So anyone who, for example, someone stayed home raising children, didn't pay into Social Security, goes to work, has a substantial career, 20, 25 years in which they pay into Social Security. Their estimate of how much they would get from Social Security is based on their work history, obviously, of 20, 25 years, whatever. For Social Security's purposes, it's the highest 35 years. And so if that includes years in which nothing was paid into the system, or very little, so be it. It's the highest 35 years of earnings. Now, we always use the highest 35, so how many people here want to work till they're 100? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. If you wanted to do that and your earnings were higher each year, it could literally replace one of the prior years, it will happen. So the positive is, as long as you're working, and if you make more money than you did previously, you can replace one of those years, you can increase your monthly benefit. The other side of the coin, however, is that we are using the highest 35 years. So do you have 35 years of earnings? And that's why it's so important. And that's why you will oftentimes hear someone say, it's better to have worked under Social Security paid something in rather than nothing, because we're using the highest 35 years. Then a formula is applied resulting in what's called the full retirement age amount. Full retirement age, you'll also hear it called the normal retirement age, just raising the retirement age whenever they use that phrase. I'm going to be using full retirement age because that's what is typically on our website. You'll hear that, but FRA, full retirement age. We'll talk what that is. Maximum amount that's taxed this year is $110,100. So when we talk about the covered, covered earnings, we're talking about earnings that are actually covered by Social Security. You pay Social Security taxes. There are people who pay in state municipality, in the states, um, education, teacher association, municipalities, uh, local uh, groups, for example, the police and fire departments might not pay in Social Security. They have their own retirement system. They do not contribute to Social Security. Those are not considered covered earnings. So when we call, talk about covered earnings, we assume you have paid taxes, Social Security taxes, in order to earn those credits that uh, allow you to, in effect, receive a monthly benefit from Social Security. So when do you start receiving retirement benefits? The first point is obviously it's a personal decision. It is a decision you make, and it reflects certain needs for you. 
terms of longevity, health, funding streams, money, um, just the desire to stop work and receive a benefit, do something else as opposed to waiting. Those are all your choices, your decisions. But if you want a retirement benefit, you can wait until your full retirement age. We're going to talk about what that is. So depending on your date of birth, it's between 65 and 67. You get your full benefit. And full benefit just means it's not reduced based on age. That's all we're talking about. You can still go on as early as age 62. However, you receive a lower monthly benefit, and it's a permanent reduction. So your, your trade-off is you get money up front earlier, but when you attain your full retirement age, that is when you turn whatever that full retirement age is, your benefit doesn't ratchet upwards in terms of those percentage. You get cost of living adjustments. If you're working, depending on what you're earning, could one of those years replace a prior year of earnings back to the 35 years, so you could increase your benefit that way. But in terms of the percentages, the lower benefit you get, you have chosen a permanent reduction. Filing early, get more money up front early, but in fact, when you hit your full retirement age, that thing, and that thing meaning your monthly benefit, and the Social Security pays on monthly basis, will not increase. So you have to be aware of that. You can get a higher monthly benefit if you work past your full retirement age. We're going to talk about that. Has anyone ever heard of a delayed retirement credit? If nothing else, when you leave today, there's one thing you will have learned, and we're going to talk about that. But first, Here's your full retirement age. Depending on your date of birth, and no one needs to raise their hand, between uh, 1943 and 54, that's when you were born, your full retirement age is 66. Notice this increases now if you're born 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, it goes up incrementally, 66 in two months, 4, 6, 8, 10. And then when born 60 and later, their full retirement age is 67. So the, the comment is made about raising retirement age or what would you do about the retirement age? This is what they're talking about, the full retirement age. So, let's use, because most of the people filing today will fall into this category, born between 43 and 54. Full retirement age is 66. You can go on, if you go over to the right side there, you'll notice as early as 62, as I said, but you get 75% of your full retirement age. You're taking a permanent reduction of 25%. This is a substantial uh, difference from what you would receive at full retirement age, but you're going on early. So you'd be going on four years prior to full retirement age, but at a three-quarter rate. Come your full retirement age, that doesn't bounce up. You've taken a permanent reduction. So, and this happens to be in the uh, handout when to start receiving retirement benefits, so I'm going to use this. If you're, and this, so there's no magic here, it's just an example. If you're a full retirement age of 66 and you were going to receive $1,000, you got on a retirement estimator or you would receive a statement that said you get $1,000 at 66, you can go on as early as 62, but you'd only get $750. I say only in the sense that it's being reduced. Now you can file any time in between these two uh, 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 ages. So you can go on 62 and a half, 63, 65 and 11 months. It's your choice. The closer you are to your full retirement age, the higher the percentage. So 100% here, 75% here, and it's graded as you get closer so that, for example, if you filed at 65 in 11 months, it would be 65, you would get 99 or not, $994 instead of 1,000. So depending on how many months prior to full retirement age you receive benefits will dictate what the reduction is. So that's permanent though, so you should be aware of that. Delayed retirement credits go on the other side. Beginning with the month of full retirement age, so depending on your date of birth, so I'm going to use 66 again, people born between 43 and 54 because those are the people filing. Ending with the month before age 70 allows a credit, and it's not that credit, the 1130, it's just a name, credit for any month it's on a monthly basis for which the worker is at least full retirement age. So in this instance, you'd have to be at least 66. You're insured for retirement benefits. In other words, you have those 40 credits, so they owe you something. You don't receive retirement benefits. We don't mean you're continuing to work or stopping work. We just mean 
you did not apply for retirement benefits. So if you fulfill those criteria, if you're born 43 or later, and this is for everyone, so someone born 1960, someone born, and this would apply as well, you get an 8% increase a year for every year after your full retirement age. So using age 66 again, $1,000 as an estimate. File as early as 62, $750. Wait until age 70, they get $1,320 per month. Trade-off, of course, is you have delayed filing for benefits for quite a few years. So longevity and health <coughs> come into play, uh, whether you need the money in funding streams. But the point is, 8% increase a year. It's really two-thirds of 1% per month. Now, for someone who is born 60 or later, therefore retirement age is 67, so they can't, they would earn 8% a year also, but eight, up until age seven, they did 70, they'd only have three years, whereas someone at 66 has four years. So in terms of the actual amount that's coming back to the person, the increase, it's key to what is the percentage that, of this 8%. So maximum 32%. So the way it works is this. Monthly benefit amounts differ based on the age you decide to start receiving. Turn about 750 here, you'll notice it goes up 800, 866, depending on your age. Age 70 over there, 1300. So if longevity is good and you can delay it, it substantially increases. The increase goes from 750 to 1320. So it's not, it's not an insubstantial amount. But again, you are waiting from 62 to 70. Yes, all the men in my family die in their early 60s. Do you think I'm waiting? So, again, longevity. I'm being facetious, but it's just a fact. So you're talking about longevity, you're talking about health. And again, you're talking about whether you need the money. But you do have an option. What we're going to be talking about in a lot of these cases, and we'll be bringing them up later, are choices. They're your choices. It's not to make it more confusing, but you do have certain options, particularly when you hit your full retirement age. We'll talk about those later. These are options, choices. I'm not saying someone should file or should not file at 62, but you have the option. Those are your choices, your decisions. You can file online, and in fact, I was at Villanova the other day, and um, well, came up and they told me how easy it was. It took about 15, 20 minutes. It, it really is that simple. If you know exactly what you want to do, I'm stopping, I'm 64, I'm stopping work at the end, da 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 I want this to begin then. Very simple and straightforward. Isn't for everyone, and we'll talk about that. But in fact, more than 50% of the people in the country actually file online now. It really is that simple. Now, that's for someone two to three months. You don't have to contact us six months or 12 months ahead. And the only reason for suggesting two to three months is if some questions come up, and we also do this if you actually see us in person or by phone, uh, it isn't the case you need to do that. In some cases, people are kind of under the gun, so they just show up the month before, it's fine. But you do want to get it a little bit ahead so we can process it and we make sure you don't lose any money. In other words, in terms of retroactivity, if that's possible, uh, we don't want you losing money. You have to file within the month, at the latest of the month you're due with benefit. So if, you're, if you want it to be paid for April, and you're under full retirement age, Filing in May, you can't say, can, can you pay me back for April or March? It just start as of May. So the idea of getting a couple months ahead of time so we know that, yes, uh, we have all the proofs. Yes, we can process it. Yes, we can get the money out to you on time, on the date we need to. And you're not losing any money. That's the point. So you can file online. It's a pretty straightforward, I know, this is back to uh, file in flannel. There we go. Apply for retirement. and. This is just the first page. You'll notice there are links on this side. What is nice about this, and I bring this up to everyone because people laugh about it, but it is sad. You can estimate your benefits. You can also continue with your application. Say you're at home, you started your application, and you've forgotten your spouse's name. <laughs> For those of you who have taken this the extra step, you realize you have far greater problems than this. Let us say that you've forgotten your name. So, I've got to get their name. You can get out of the application. It will sit there, gives you a number to come back on. You find their name, however you want to do that. You go back, 
open it up, and now you can put in, this is my spouse's name. Also your spouse's social security number, um, date of marriage, which a lot of people appear to have forgotten, either deliberately or not so deliberately. But the point is, you can always go back and start the application over. So it is very useful, it allows you to more freedom in that sense. But as I said, not everyone can file or wants to file online. Survivors can, widows or widowers, children can. Uh, there are a lot of issues and that you might want to have someone talk to you about. And it's not so simple as I'm stopping tomorrow, I'm heading for the Bahamas and you know, goodbye. You need more information. So you want to talk to someone. You can do it by phone, do an in-office point. I always mention this to everyone. My father-in-law was in retail and he's one of those people who wants to talk to people. He doesn't feel comfortable if he hasn't gotten feedback from a person. Which is probably why he was great in retail. Terrific. But he wanted to talk to a representative for all of the questions that might come to him suddenly while he's talking to someone and give him an explanation. Because of that, this is what he decided to do. So choices here. There are options again on that. But if you know what you're doing, you've already made the decision, and you're going online. And by the way, you can always call the 1-800 number asking general questions. You can always contact us and so forth. But necessary evidence for filing. You need the social security number. So husband and wife are filing. Each one need the social security number for them. We might not, and in most cases, do not need a birth certificate anymore. Because of our relationships with the Bureau of Vital Statistics and all the states, and because of our own records, if they're all in agreement, we probably won't even need the birth certificate. It's good to have it in case there's something in our system that's not quite in agreement, and we need to look at that just to be sure. But in most cases, we don't need it. W-2 or self-employment tax return. Future earnings estimates. We're going to talk about why that matters. As of today, actually it was as of last May, anyone filing for benefits has to have basically the electronic deposit. You've got to have direct deposit. So have that information available. Uh, Treasury releases it. It goes right into whatever account you give us. Information about the marriages, divorces, if they're pertinent, we'll talk about that. Some information uh, about military or railroad might be necessary. Those tend to be unusual, but just as a reminder, if, for example, you work for the railroad for quite a number of years and you might be doing a retirement benefit from them, those kinds of questions will come up. And that's whether it's online that you're applying or you're doing it through by phone or in person. So, who was born between the first and the tenth? Okay. You will be paid on the second Wednesday of the month. Born between 11 and 20, you'll be paid on the third Wednesday. That's when you receive your benefit. In other words, in terms of the direct deposit, it'll go into the account then. And who was born between 21st and 31st? blame your parents for that. It's a fourth Wednesday. So depending on your birthday, you'll get paid second or third or fourth Wednesday of the month. Why is this important? Aside from the fact that if you have a husband and wife and one was born in between 1st and 10th, the other between 21st and 31st, they're going to be different, is you have to live throughout the month in order to receive a benefit for the month. In other words, if you're entitled to a benefit from Social Security for April, it shows in May. May and June, June, July, July, and August. So you, you have to live throughout the month on it. So this will be say, received by you the month after you're entitled to it. In other words, if April you're due, your date of birth is between 1st and 10th, you'll receive it on the second Wednesday of May. Your May benefit will show on the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of June, and so forth. So just letting you know. Now once you're used to it, it's pretty straightforward. But it is a little confusing for someone in terms of, one, I get paid after I live throughout the month, and I'm getting paid on a specific Wednesday based on my date of birth. We go through this for you, just so you will be aware of that. Taxation of benefits. Less than one-third of our current beneficiaries pay taxes on their benefits. Or, if you want to go the other way, almost one-third of our beneficiaries pay taxes on their Social Security. We don't do taxes. If you go online and type in the search, do I have to pay tax on Social Security, it'll give you 
a couple very short paragraphs, show you the threshold levels, and immediately send you here to the IRS publication 915. Social Security and Equivalent Railroad Retirement Benefits. This covers in great detail the issues about taxation and Social Security. We don't do taxes. Just as we don't do Medicare and durable medical goods, Medicare handles that. We don't do taxes. Internal Revenue handles that. And so that's it's a very good publication, by the way. It really does go into detail, great detail, to explain for people what it is that counts so that you do you or do you not have to pay taxes on your Social Security. That's where you should go. You can, though, have federal taxes withheld. You're not required, it's your choice, but if you choose, you can have them withheld from your Social Security. Like you need a W-4, and like any other W-4, you can change it. So you do select only a certain percentage. You can't say, I want $97.50. I mean, they allow you to withhold a certain percentage, but you can change that. So you can stop it, you can increase it. You don't have to do this when you file. You can contact us later. So if you want to see how everything plays out, how it's working in terms of the pension, and then contact us later, certainly all right. So it helps to do everything in a nice, neat package in the beginning, but if you haven't decided, you can come back later on. We can make those decisions, or those changes for you on the decisions you've made. You can also work and get Social Security at the same time. The reason I do these screenshots is that you don't have just a talking head. You actually can get online, and we'll talk about all of these issues. I'm only condensing what's already on here. Before full retirement age, and this always goes back, you make a distinction before and after full retirement age. At full retirement age, as I say, you have certain options, choices, advantages. Prior to full retirement age, there are limit, certain limitations, such as to reduce benefit if you file for benefits early. Also, before, work before full retirement age, there are limits on how much you can earn and still receive all of your Social Security benefits. Now, when we say we work, we do mean work from employment or earnings, not your pensions. Mutual, not your mutual funds, check account, savings account, other things like that, 401ks, or savings. No. Are you working for yourself or somebody else? But if you are, there are going to be limits. So when you file for benefits, one of the questions, whether you're doing it online or talking to a person by phone, or in the office, but going to be asking. And so before you do anything else, you need to know, are you going to continue working? If you are, or if you're cutting back, but will you be working? How much will you be earning? Because we're asking about earnings. Now, I mean, this, the, the I'm dealing with somebody who works for someone else, not self-employment. That's a little different, but they're still the same in terms of there are limits. The pamphlet that I have over there, how work affects your benefits, goes into detail as this website. Just generally, we're going to do it this way. Up until your full retirement age, there are limits. There's no limit once you attain your full retirement age. At full retirement age, so if your full retirement age is 66, you're born between 43 and 54, there are no limits on how much you can earn as far as still receiving your Social Security benefits. Full retirement age, no limit. Now, we do make a suggestion, and this is, again, a choice. Depending on when you turn your full retirement age and the year that you attain full retirement age, you're actually 66, say, this year. What if you turn 66 in April or May or July? You would have an option would you have wanted to contact us earlier or even file now and get a slightly reduced benefit. Again, it's not going to be 25% because you're right here. You're already on the threshold of full retirement age. Perhaps 25% is too great a cut, but maybe 1% or 2%, you know, I'm getting 98% on my Social Security, that's fine. It's a choice, but it's not retroactive. So if you turn full retirement age in April, you want to pay, pay for January, you would have had to have contacted us at least by the, no later than the last day of January so that we could pay you for the next few months. So think about that when you, the year you attain your full retirement age, do you want to file? Again, it's a choice, it's an option. We just don't want to imply to people that if you didn't follow, you either wait to your full retirement age or you follow. Oh, surely. The earnings limits for this year 
And kind of bear with me, uh, please bear with me, there, there are two different limits. And they're based on whether you are under your full retirement age or you're attaining your full retirement age in the current year. If you're under full retirement age, the maximum you can earn is $14,640. Do not ask me why they just don't make it $15,000 so people like me can do this proper subtraction, but it's $14,640. That's the limit. We're going to talk about how that works. The year you attain your full retirement age, so say you were turning 66 this year, 2012, you could earn almost $39,000 up to prior to the month you turn your full retirement age. So for some people, it's worthwhile, and this goes back to filing early, that, okay, I, it's January, I could file, I could receive a few months of benefits, and I'm allowed to make almost $39,000. I might be stopping at the end. And remember, once you attain your full retirement age, there are no limits on the earnings. This earnings limit, the annual earnings test limits, stops once you turn to full retirement age. So that's why they have those two. This thing goes throughout the whole year. So in fact, someone whose full retirement age is in April, the, could, that individual could earn almost 39,000 between January and March. And someone whose retirement age, full retirement age is December, could earn 39,000 between January in November. So they don't prorate it. They don't break out the months other than to say, year you turn your full retirement age, that's, that's the, the amount you could earn without losing any Social Security benefits. Once you're at your full retirement age, again, they won't withhold. We're going to talk about these little monthly ones in a second also, but I want to go through the yearly. So if you're under your full retirement age, it's a rule of one for two. Social Security holds back $1 of benefits for every $2 over the yearly allowable limit this year, $14,640. If this goes up next year, it'll be one of two for whatever that amount, maybe $14,800, maybe $15,000. So somebody like me can say $15,000. One for two, which is a pretty substantial loss. The year of your full retirement age, not only can you earn more, but Social Security only withholds one for two, or one for three, right? So instead of losing 50%, you only lose 33 and change, and a third percent of what's lever over this amount, which is substantially more, significantly so, than under full retirement. So two different amounts, much easier in the year of retirement. Prior to that, much more difficult, much more challenging, because you can't earn nearly as much, and you lose one for every two. So the point is, if you're going to be retiring, as in filing for social security benefits, but you're not really retiring from work, you're leaving here and going somewhere else, we will be asking how much will you be earning? What are the amounts that you're earning? Do you intend to continue work? What are your future earnings? And so just be aware of that. Once you're at full retirement age, we're not asking that because you're doing your benefits. So here's a sample computation. You're at $24,640. Again, bear with me. This is just so I can subtract. And your limit's $14,640. So you contacted us and said, I found this great job. Everybody loves me. I love them. This is terrific. Here's my new career. But I'm starting out slow. $24,640. You make that. $14,640 is the limit. So what's left over, $10,000 over the limit, half of that, $5,000 in benefits would have to be withheld. So if you're getting $1,000 a month, January through December, for example, we withhold January, February, March, April, May, and June through December would pay you the remainder of the yearly amount. They won't prorate it, they just knock out every month until they get to the point where there's either nothing there, they're not going to go into the next year, it's just in terms of calendar year, or if there's anything left, they'll pay you whatever remains. If retirement benefits are withheld because of your earnings, in other words, if we do withhold because you are, the benefits are increased at your full retirement age to take into account the months in which benefits were withheld. What they mean is, the only reason you're reduced by 25% or 20% or 15 when you file prior to your full retirement age is on the assumption that you're going to receive all those months of benefits. But if you work and we withhold some of those months, you didn't receive it, obviously, and so Siri will go back and say, 
we paid you based on a reduction of, say, 48 months, because you went on 62, but what if you, we withheld three months of benefits each year, 62, 63, 64, 64? Well, we would have withheld 12 months of benefits. You never got them. So security would go back, change it later on after full retirement age, and say, we were paying you as if you went on at 62, but now we'll pay you as though you went on at 63, because we didn't pay you all of those months of benefits that you would follow. them. So the reduction, that percentage, is a little less, depending on, of course, how many months we withheld. One versus 12 versus 24. Yes, sir? The question, <clears throat> the 38,000 and change, that's before your birthday of the year you turn The month. Time. The month of your full retirement age. They okay. do it completely on the month. The month you are hit your full retirement age, whatever, that's it. It's only prior to that. Prior to that. Right. Within that calendar year. Which and is, you can make as much yes. as you want after that. And it doesn't oh, yes. Work. You can become Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> well, perhaps you're not yeah. becoming Oprah Winfrey, but we'll pick someone else. But if you become Oprah Winfrey, or over Winfrey 2, so you could have your own network, OWN2, you can do that and still get your Social Security. So it's only at the point that you are not at your full retirement. And that's why I say you have more options and there are more advantages as far as that's concerned. In terms of work, if you want to work later on, Social Security will still send you your benefits. And, by the way, because you're still working, if you're paying enough, on your, in terms of Social Security taxes, that you can bump one of those earlier years. You have that somewhat unique situation of getting your Social Security, but your benefit would also be increasing on a regular basis because each year you have bumped a lower year because you're paying, re earning more money. So now that's all key to your own earnings record, of course. Yes, sir. Does that still happen after 70? That happens forever. If you made, remember, it was 110,100. If next year it goes up, the cap will be a little higher. You'll pay taxes on that. That, no doubt, will replace something because that's a maximum year. Now, the, I have to say, if, you, if you've been paying on the maximum all your life, you won't see a bump up. It'll go up a few dollars. It's not going to go up 50 or or $100 because overall, remember, you're balancing, you're replacing one of the lower years, but you'll have paid the maximum perhaps all of your life or the earnings you're having now aren't that much higher. So you're, depending on who you are in terms of your earnings record, one person can see a substantial bump because I went, I have a zero year and I just replaced it with 110,100. And another person just replaced 100,000, uh, 6,000 with 110. It doesn't bounce up as much, you don't see that. But they will always examine that. And so yes, as long as you're working, paying into Social Security, and that er those earnings can replace in your work history one of the prior years. They always examine that. They're always going back. And so you'll have people who will say to you, I received this letter from Social Security and they just increased my benefit by or 10 to $15. That's what it is. It's reflecting the prior year's earnings. Mm -hmm. There is a one-time earnings rule. You'll, it's in the booklet and I don't want to spend too much time, but I want to emphasize it is the yearly amount divided by 12. So, for example, if you're, it's usually used the first year of retirement. You're not yet in your full retirement year prior to this, 12 20. If you're in your full retirement year, again, before you hit your full retirement age, it's 32 40. So, I'm going to use this one because this is the more common one, the typical one. 12 20. It's just $14,640 divided by 12. Any month, that you're earning that or less when you file for benefits, and you only get one shot, one year on this, you can receive a benefit from Social Security regardless of how much you earn prior to that point. In other words, how many people here earn a million dollars a year? Don't be shy. Okay, thank you. There's always one in every group. Well, I look like you needed somebody right now. I needed someone to volunteer. Thank you, sir. Bless you. And I'm optimistic. I, <laughs> optimism is good. Hope is all right. So, say you're working from January through June. You were making a million. You're going to stop halfway through the year. I'm going to make half a million. No one really needs me to go through that. Uh, 500,000 minus 14,640 pretty much blows away the chance of sending you any money in a year. So, if you were going to work January, February, March, April, May, June, earning that, 
what do you do in terms of Social Security? Well, if, starting July, you were going to earn less than that $1,220, the monthly limit, the monthly limit goes up every year if the yearly amount goes up. If you did that, you would be paid for every single month. So, for example, you make $500,000, you just stop work. Social Security will send you all of your benefits for the first year. This is important for a couple of reasons. One, it has to do with if you were to do benefits, vacation, sick pay, early out, anything like that, severance, where, okay, I left work in June, but I'm not working now, but in September, I got a check from my employer. Are you working? No, they owe me the money. We could ignore this, and we would act as if it had been earned as of June, because you're not working. So the important point is, when you file, the question is, you make as much as you like up until you, know, you file. But at the end, we're going to ask in terms of the yearly amount and in terms of the monthly, which pays you the most. This has one qualifier. You can't go over 1220. They don't do one for two. They just withhold the benefit because they said the point is we'll ignore whatever you made beforehand. Don't worry. We'll pay you. But are you under that amount? If you are, you get your check. If you're not, it's withheld. So you have a choice. You have an option. It's a one time deal, the monthly test. Thereafter, we use the yearly. But the point is make as much as you like when you decide to actually file for benefits. I said make as much as you'd like as if most of you are limiting how much you would because you would be making a billion, but you chose to come here and listen to me, and I thank you for that. But if you do that, make as much as you like, when you file for benefits, we're going to ask, are you working? In most cases, you're going to go, I'm going to be under the monthly test. Okay, they'll send you one. Now, if you find that you want to go back to work or something like that, that's something different, you want to talk to us. But the option is for you, once you've stopped work, think about you getting benefits from Social Security. Even if you're going to have early out, some sick pay might be paid, vacation pay, and it all gets paid later on. We can exclude all of it because you're not working. It also means you could go back and earn 12 20 or less if you wanted to work part-time. The next year, it's just the yearly limit, whatever it is. So the year after this, next year, if you use this this year, in 2013, what is the annual limit? If it's 14640 plus a little bit more, that's the limit for the year. Whether you make it in a day, a week, a month, it doesn't matter. But in this case, first time, and it's usually for somebody who's filing for retirement. Because if you don't have this, for many people, if you've been working for quite a number of years, you're at the point where you don't want to just file in December or January because you're stuck either of those. You're able to choose when you want to file. And that's perfect. Now, benefits for your spouse. We quickly want to go through this. Even if they've never worked under Social Security, a spouse can receive benefits. The way it works first in terms of who receives benefits. Spouse's benefits, the person's currently married. So we are talking about someone who's currently married. They've been married for 12 months. They have to be age 62. In other words, a spouse can file only as early as age 62 on the worker's account. And I say this most of the time. Husband wife, it's gender neutral. But in the main, women file for spouse's benefits on their husband's accounts far more often than husbands file on their wives. You can do either way. I'm going to do husband and wife only so I don't have to remember which one I'm talking about as the worker, but that's it. It could go either way. So if I say husband and wife, you can flip them. So in this case, I'm going to use husband and wife as though the wife had never paid into Social Security. She's not doing any other pensions, anything else. They've been married uh, at least a year. She's got to be at least 62. It's the earliest she can file. The worker has to be entitled. He would have to either file for retirement benefits, or if he's disabled, he'd be 56 and receiving disability benefits, he'd have to be entitled to a benefit. She could file on his account. There are also benefits for people under 62, disabled or child under age 16. I'm not talking about that unless you have a question. There are also, now remember, we're talking about somebody who's currently married, both people are alive, husband and wife. There are also 
divorced spouses' benefits. Most of the same criteria apply in terms of the spouse, but in addition, has to be 10 years of marriage. 10 calendar years. Can't be nine. You don't get extra credit for 12. It's a, just a threshold like the other women's, okay? 10 years of marriage. Age 62, again, is the earliest. There's a reduction because they're going on early. The worker has to be age 62. Disability doesn't work in this case. They've got to be age 62. Husband and wife. If the wife is fine on the husband, the wife cannot be married until she's fine for divorce spouse's benefits on his account number, but he can be married. Or vice versa. In other words, the person who's filing for spouse's benefits, male or female, cannot be married because they're received, because they're currently divorced, not currently married, but the worker on whom they're filing for a benefit, filing on someone else's social security number, that person can be married. So you could have use husband, current spouse, ex-spouse, all three can sit at the same desk, separate chairs, talk to the client's representative, and each one can be filed on for benefits. Notice, it does not reduce payments made to the worker's current spouse. They're completely independent of each other. So we're going to show how they figure this, what, what the system is in terms of the computation the formulas. But the point is, no one loses any money because the divorce spouse is on. A worker doesn't lose any money because the current spouse is on. Completely independent. So all of those statements you received that said, this is how much you get on retirement for you, that's what you get regardless of any dependence. You don't get any more if no one files. You don't receive any less if a current spouse, an ex-spouse, and an ex-spouse, and an ex-spouse, and an ex-spouse, why not? It was a short shelf life. The point is, that does not affect, they're all independent. The reason you usually and typically do not get an ex-spouse and an ex-spouse and an ex-spouse and an ex-spouse is that spouse's benefits are calculated differently from retirement benefits. A spouse's benefit, the maximum a spouse can receive, top of the line, is 50% of the worker's full retirement age. It doesn't matter whether the worker actually filed at 62 or 3, it's what's their full retirement age. But the spouse has to be full retirement age. This is why I was mentioning about the reduction in 62. So, husband and wife come in, he's 66, and she's 66, the maximum she could receive on his social security number, if he gets 1,000, is, you have it exactly, 500. <clears throat> if she's under full retirement age, it'll be reduced based on age. So, this maximum of 50% is what precludes oftentimes having the ex-spouse, 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 just by virtue of 50% is the maximum they could get. Again, doesn't affect the worker's monthly benefit amount. There is one interesting little twist here. If the spouse is insured before full retirement age now, they're fine. If before full retirement age, if insured, the spouse must file for their own retirement benefits. They are, in effect, deemed to have filed as a spouse if they could get an additional benefit. We're going to talk about additional benefits, but as a, what, a spouse, what that means for a spouse. They do more on their own record, no spouse's benefit is paid. And what it means is, if a husband and wife come in, husband files for retirement benefits, wife is due retirement benefits, might be doing additional amount as a spouse, the wife could not say, let me just file for retirement and I'll come back for my spouse. It has to file for both at the same time. File for one, you file for both. The regulations prior to full retirement age is you have to file for both. Once you're at full retirement age, though, if you have not filed the spouse's full retirement age, eligible for a spouse's benefit and his or her own retirement benefit, they can delay receiving their retirement benefits for the delayed retirement credits and just receive the full spouse's benefit. And the reason for it is they can restrict at that point. They're not deemed to a file. They're not forced to file because it, they're full retirement age. They have a choice now. They can say, no, I'll just receive spouses. I'll come back later on to my delayed retirement credits. And they come out with, once again, with those percentages. Now, when I say come back, 
come back within the framework of age 70 or before. So for some people, they want to file at 67, 67 and a half. Others want to wait all the way till 70, their choice. So when I say come back, they make the choice when they actually want to receive that benefit. But you have a choice. This is on our website about before and after full retirement age. I'm going through all these for a specific point. Prior to full retirement age, you have lots of limitations placed on your options. At full retirement age, you have many more options and advantages from being able to earn more to the point of not having to worry about any annual earnings test limitations, to receiving your full unreduced benefit, to getting the late retirement credits, to when you receive a certain benefit, spouses or your own. All of those are choices you can make. Now, some of them are obvious, some of them are not so obvious, you have to work through them, but the point is you have choices. In a lot of cases, when we get pre retirement seminars, the desire is kind of like, here's an example, I do this, what's the right thing to do? Well, it's not that simple. Unfortunately, it ends up being a bit more confusing because you have to make choices. Which one is best for you? Well, it might not be perfect. This is good, that's good. Okay, which is the one you want? So security can't say, that's the best choice in the universe. Because they're your choices, they're your options. You get to make those decisions. But you do have choices and more options at full retirement age. Which is why oftentimes you'll hear people going, I'm waiting till full retirement age so that they can actually use some of these You'll see them called strategies, tactics. The point is you just have more choices, more options at full retirement age anyway. So let's give an example. Husband, unreduced benefit, and there's no magic, I just use this to divide. $1,400. Wife's on her own record would get $600. But if she waited, it never worked on social security, waited until full retirement age, she gets half of his. So she's 66, she only gets 600 on her own, 700 on his, what Social Security does is make up the difference. In other words, she'll get paid 600 on her own, 100 on her husband's, because she's full retirement age. She only sees one benefit, it's 700, but she gets the full 50%. So she can't lose. Now, what if she gets more on her own? Well, then she's not filing on his because she gets more. But again, what's most advantageous? She's not going to lose money. But this just guarantees that she doesn't lose because she's paid into Social Security. Go the other way. If he were at 600 and she's 1400, it would be the other way around, but the same process. So I'm just quickly going to go through this, not worry about the reduced amount, but the point is there are options for spouses and for workers, for divorced spouses. But one thing for all of them, prior to full retirement age, and this includes, and we're going to talk about survivor's benefits also now, widows and widows. All of the individuals who file for benefits, retirement, spouse, ex-spouse, widows, widowers, surviving divorce spouses, all of those people, the actual earnings limits apply to them. In other words, the earnings limits that we were talking about before the 14640 prior to full retirement, that applies not just to a worker. It applies to all the other individuals who are under full retirement. So a widow who's 60, we're going to talk about that, and your earnings limit. Uh, the spouse who files, who's 63, is a spouse working, annual earnings limit. So you just have to be aware, prior to full retirement age, all of these people are affected by that annual limit, whatever it is, as it goes up each year. Once again, for all of them, full retirement age, not perfect. This is our survivor's planner page. Simply as possible. Survivor benefits, earliest is age six, she could, depending on her age, could receive one half of his full retirement age, and then it's reduced based on her age. He dies, the maximum she gets now is this, not that. In other words, when you file for reduced benefit, not only do you get a lesser amount for you, the person, not only are there limits on how much you can earn, but when you die, if there are survivor benefits, the linchpin, Key, the focal point will be what you're currently receiving, not what you would have received if you had waited to your full retirement age. Go ahead, sure. Okay. Um, if the husband does the delayed retirement credit and gets the full 1320 yeah. and then dies at 75, the surviving spouse will get the full 1320 yes. or 50%? No, she gets the whole she thing. She gets the full, huh? Yes, because that 
when this is right. this. Right. Now, if she's under, notice, say he was getting this. He's 70, but she's 60. And you're different. He dies. She would get a lesser amount, 71 and 71 and a half percent because of that. So she can file any time from 60 up to her full retirement age, but it'll be reduced based on how early she's going on. Okay. But if she's full retirement age, she'll get the full amount. So that's why I mentioned these breakouts. It's keyed always to these, right. and this is why you don't always get a nice one easy answer for it, because you have to ask, well, what about this, what about this, what's the scenario of each one? This is why it's a different problem. Yes, sir? What happens, take a couple in their 40s. They both work 10 years, so they have the credits. Yeah. And then one buys a car accident. The deceased that's earned credits. Yeah. When the survivor reaches age 62 or 66, whatever, does he or she then get a benefit from the deceased spouse even though it was 20 years ago? Oh, yeah. And thank you for leading into this. You know, as I have these options here, I've gone on and on and on about the reduction. And that isn't to stop people from filing for early benefits, but being aware of if you receive a reduced benefit, what, what happens. The one case where filing early is, is a, might be a good idea is when you were talking about, and it doesn't even have to be at 40, it could be 50, say, whatever. Well, I just Someone, yeah, game. right, because of that, but it sits there. If they're potentially entitled as a widow or a widow, they fulfill the criteria, whether the person filed or not. The question is then, once they're 60, we can look to see are they entitled to a benefit. Remember, we're asking, are you working? So let's assume they're 62. They're going to stop working. They're entitled on their own, but they're also potentially entitled as a survivor. And by the way, this, if the individuals who died X number of years ago, all of the cost of the living adjustments apply to that as well. So you get someone who died quite a few years ago, the uh, individual's children were brought, uh, brought under Social Security. They received benefits. And so there was a certain amount, and the spouse sometimes will say, well, all they received 20 years ago was such and such. I don't think 20 years of cost of living adjustments has now applied. So yes, they'll look at that and say, are you entitled to a widow's benefit or widows? Okay. What you can do is file for reduced benefits on one of those two account numbers, either the deceased person's or your own. Receive benefits and at your, until you hit your full retirement age and hitting a team, you reach your full retirement age, at which point then you can apply for the other benefit at an unreduced amount. So it would be in the interest of someone to say, okay, I'll file either as a survivor, remember you might want to delay retirement credits, or depending on how much you get, see this is all key to how much would you receive from each one, but you might say, okay, I'll file on my own and come back and file for the widows or widowers later on. You have that option. Reduced benefit, and then later on, an unreduced. And the reason for it is there are two different things you're filing for. So you have, that's one of the cases where you do have a choice prior to full retirement age of saying, I'll file early on one account number, and you can do it as early as 60 and then go on your own, but I'm thinking 62 is a, it's a nice balance to decide which one do you want, and then come back later on and file on the other. So yes, the, that, as a possibility, always exists. We're always going to look and see that. So then, let's say that couple went in there at the 40. One survives, and they have a couple children or whatever, mm -hmm. age six or whatever. They could, the surviving spouse could, could apply for child benefit under the deceased spouse? Yes. At that point? Oh, sure. Yes, definitely. It's one of the things you're paying for. We don't talk about it very much, but there's a, a couple of million children receiving benefits, survivor benefits, because of a deceased parent. And so, child or worker under 16, and actually it goes up to age 18, I'm going to show you this, but in terms of what the, the survivor would receive, so mom's receiving a benefit, if, again, if mom's not working, or is below the annual earnings limit, but the children would receive benefits on the deceased person's account. We'll show, I'm going to show you the years on that. So it's not just a widow or a widower or surviving divorce spouse. We are talking about children here on that. So that's a perfect scenario. 
and that does not preclude the widow from coming back 15 years later and filing as a widow on that same account number. Because they're separate, separate that account can file on her own, or his own, file, because this goes both ways, remember, or on their own social security number or as a survivor. And is there a, a length of time they need to be married? Yeah, I mean, you have to be married basically a year. It's really that it's a nine, a year for if they were alive, nine months if they're deceased, basically. Um, there are a couple of exceptions on it, but basically nine months is what we're talking about. Um, children under age 18 with parent receiving benefits or parent deceased, the one just asking on this. Student benefit is paid to unmarried children, same criteria, retirement disability survivors who are full-time students, it's, there's no post-secondary, it's only up to, up to secondary. So say the child turns 18 in January, they're in high school till June, so SCRI would pay them student benefits in effect February, March, April, May, and June. And there is what's called a disabled adult child, individuals who are disabled prior to 22. They can be over 18, they can be 28, 38, but they are disabled say prior to 22, and they receive benefits, again, on a parent receiving, parent deceased. That's all on our website, children's benefits. So back again, the survivor's benefits, you'll notice, that will hang in there, not just for the children, it doesn't use it all up. That resource is still there for a widow or widow, widow or, I'm sorry, say widow or. Who gets Medicare? 65 or older, eligible for Social Security benefits, work for 10 years on their government entity. There are people who are on disability who receive Medicare. It's the same Medicare. I'm not getting to go into it unless you have questions, but in terms of people who get it, bulk of the people receiving it, 65 or older. Traditional Medicare A and B, and this is the one when you receive a Medicare card. Hospital insurance part A paid for by that 1.45% you already pay out. You see that, it says Medicare tax. It says it pays 100% of, and this is the qualifier, covered in inpatient costs. So limitations, deductibles, exclusions, it's not paying for the, uh, the television set in the private room, that sort of thing. It doesn't pay for a lot of other things because you do have exclusions and deductibles. Very limited nursing home coverage, still nursing facility. Very, very short period of time. That part B is what most people are familiar with because it's paid for by premiums. They're used to, oh, they take the money out of my benefit. Covers 80% of doctors and outpatient bills, but again, the 80% put a question mark. It has to be approved by Medicare. Um, may not need Part B is still worth it. We'll explain why that is. Standard Medicare Part B monthly premium is per, per person. So, husband and wife, both are 65. One of the two has to is paid the Social Security. Both of them are entitled to Medicare A. They've already paid for it then. Part B, each one would have 99.90 out of their benefit. So it's per person. Premiums rise if your income is higher. So you might need people who say, in fact, five, about 5% 5 of people are affected by it, would say, I've been paying X amount of dollars. So it's this plus an additional amount. And it's a tiered system depending on the income. So you can have two or three people with differing amounts. So 99.90 is the base amount, standard, but it could be higher. And again, may not need it, it's still working. Surely can. Um, if if you went on Medicare, uh, you were 65, and you took Part B initially, and then found out you were covered under your wife's plan and dropped Part B. Now, when the wife retires, that Part B's got to be picked up by the husband. Yes. And that Part B's going to come out of his Social Security number. Is there a, um, would it be the same, $99.90? We're going to get to that. Okay. Okay, because it's a good question. It's coming right up. This is the Medicare website. Just want to mention it to you because you can find plans that have services. So if you want to find Medigap plans, plans that pick up where Medicare leaves off, assuming you don't have an employer group health plan, for example. And I just plug this in. This is Havertown, 19083. They, they actually will kind of customize it depending on this, but this is very simple. So I just did this. Health status, good. You have a Medigap plan. No, I don't. What they will do is list the plans in your area. 
that are available. There are 49 companies offering, now this is Medigap Policy A. There are different alphas in terms of, of the, the kind of policies but that are, are in this area. Not to be confused with Part A. I know, yes. Do, do not ask me why. Really? <laughs> and and you, you can read lots of policies and it's hard. The Medicare Supplemental, Medicare Supplementary, but no, Medicare Supplementary Insurance is Medicare Part B. But what does this private sector, yes. You have, it is one of the reasons we're saying about going online, there's a plethora of agencies, uh, companies, insurance companies, names, the nomenclature, they, they tend to overlap and you can think one means one thing versus another. This is why I mentioned this. What's nice about this is it kind of helps you winnow it down. It doesn't make it easy necessarily in terms of choices because you still have lots of options. And the coverage of what they can and cannot do always becomes a challenge. So I, I don't mean to be too glib, oh, it takes a few minutes. But what is nice is it is available, and you can limit this down and start working it down. Uh, but it was pointed out in the session this morning, one woman said, I like it that as I get older and I have more difficulties, things got more complicated. <laughs> you might be able to appreciate the more the greater complication. I have nothing I can offer or that I'm afraid. So if you're receiving already Social Security, you're already on, you're enrolled. Medicare will enroll you automatically at age 65. In other words, you'll receive a Medicare card. They mail it to you. If you're not on, no one will hunt you down. In other words, if you don't con uh, contact Social Security to either file only for Medicare, which you can, you can file for Medicare online by itself, or you file for cash benefits prior to your full retirement age, in this case, prior to age 65, they'll enroll you automatically. But if you don't contact us at all, no one will come hunting you. Now, one of the points is all those Medigap policies assume you have Medicare and B, by the way. And we'll talk about the employer group health plan now. You can file for A three months prior to 65. You can file, you've already paid for it, insurers, it's your decision. B has a seven month enrollment period, three months before age 65, and then three months after. If you miss this enrollment period, you can only then enroll in the next general enrollment period between January and March. So say you turn 65 in June. So you have March, April, May, and then you have July, August, September. Around, if you miss that period, the next time you are able to apply file for or apply for Medicare, will be in January of 2013. And it won't kick in. In other words, it doesn't start working until July. So the real, now you'll notice premiums will are raised about 10% for every calendar year you miss. 10% on top of whatever the current premium is. Unless you not file for 10, 20, 30 years, it, it's a, that's a minor increase. But this does matter because you're waiting a long time. So if you didn't file for Medicare Part B, and in November you said, wow, I better file for B, you couldn't file until January through March. And there's no magic. The three months is just an enrollment period, whether you file on the 31st of March or January 1st. But it wouldn't begin until July 1. Now, there is an exception for what I'm talking about. Uh, so that's A and B. Medicare C, you'll, you will see it on um, the Medicare website, other, and oftentimes the private companies will mention Medicare Advantage. Basically, it's like HMOs and so forth. They work with Medicare. You have to have A and B. It's just everything is packaged together. So hospital, medical, the sort of drug plans that you might have might be uh, uh, with lower premiums and so forth, but you'll always be paying Part B. You're always on A and B. And you'll meet some people who will say, Oh, I'm, I'm on this particular HMO. I'm not on Medicare anymore. Well, what they mean is the HMO handles everything. They don't have to go to Medicare because the HMO does this, but in fact, they've actually paid. They're still paying. They have not disenrolled. They are on Medicare. Other parts, again, we enroll Medicare A and B. All the billing, Medicare HMOs, the part of the drug plan, all of those are through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Sure. We have a little extra help, and I say little in the sense we have a very small portion of Medicare, which is for individuals with limited income and resources for Medicare Part D, which is the prescription drug program we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but 
aside from that, everything else goes through Medicare. So you'll see us, we're your portal, your, you know, uh, actually your entry into getting into the system, but all of the questions go through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is why I bring up the Medicare website at www.medicare.gov. They're very important you want to think about that if you want information about Medicare. If you're covered by an employer group health plan, which is the question you would have, someone's covered by an employer group health plan. Workers and spouse, you can still file timely. We won't worry about A, you know, we'll talk about it later. But part B, if you are under an employer group health plan, either through your employment or through your spouse, if somebody has to be currently employed, so you're retired, but you're on your spouse's employer group health plan. You can choose not to file for Part B or withdraw from Part B if for some reason you were on and now you're hired and you're covered. And you can delay paying for Part B until this ends, either your employment ends or your coverage ends. Because in some cases there are differences in coverage or something changes. Uh, so it's the earliest of the two. Usually we're talking about employment. So when you were talking about the individual who files on the wife, he's retired. He's on her employer or health plan. He doesn't have Part B. When she stops work, he now has eight months to apply and enroll in Medicare Part B, during which there will be no penalty. They give him an eight-month window because some companies will cover someone Yes, your employment ended in September, but we're going to cover you to the end of December, so January is when this ends. So that's why they give you eight months. There's no retroactivity. So the point is, they want to contact us as soon as possible. They would get Medicare Part B. There would be no penalty. That, that, January, that general enrollment period does not apply. If there are no penalties involved, they would pay the same Medicare as everyone else. Even though he was in it before and dropped out? But he dropped out for this. Correct. He dropped out because I covered him. Right. That's, now that's the qualifier. He can't try to drop out. For, as long as he was covered, he can withdraw. So if you have some, and so this happens to people, with someone, he might have gone out and gotten a job on his own. So he's 67 years old. He's paid for Part B for two years. I've got a job. I have an employer group health plan. I'm going to run a cover me forever. He can literally withdraw. Because you saved that $99. Exactly. And so if you have a couple, you save $200 a month. So it's $2,400 a year minus the one cent change. So it is in the interest for people to do that. And there are a couple other good reasons why you might want to delay, but usually that's the one. So no penalty for filing. You want to check with your employee. Now it has to be 20 or more employees. I think you have more than 20 here. Uh, the one qualifier is, and I know you don't have it, but if you have a, a, a spouse has it, there are health savings accounts in uh, Archer uh, medical savings accounts, usually these are higher earning uh, people with higher earnings, who actually could be penalized because they signed up for Part A. So you'd want to talk to your benefits people or somebody about who, who handles the, the health benefits in your company uh, to ask, is it okay to file for A? If it is, you can file for it. I, but the fact is you can delay A. Remember, you've paid for it, so you can file at any time. No one will hunt you down, but if you want to, file for A. You can do that online. You know, you saw Patty Duke in her flannels. It takes 15 minutes because you're not, you know, if you wish. If, on the other hand, you don't want to, uh, and I'm betting that he's already on A. He's on A. Because he's already got cash benefits. See, this is the one point. You can file for Medicare and, pre uh, and delay filing for cash benefits cannot file for cash benefits and delay filing for Medicare A. It's automatic. But Part B, you have a choice on. And people do withdraw. And they say, I'm withdrawing because I'm on an employer group health plan. And as long as you are, that's fine. As soon as he stops, he gets the eight months. Now, if, if he waited nine months, then we're back to the general enrollment period. So it's really important to contact us. And the reason is contact us a couple months ahead because you file just a form that says, I want Medicare Part B. But we give you another form to be completed by your employer or your benefits person who will say, yes, he was covered under our employer group health plan, and this is when it ends. So we have to prove that. 
that's, that's established. So that bottom part, check with your employer, applies to part B, not part B. Or part A. Part A. I'm sorry. This, this goes with part A. This part, I apologize. Ignore this one. There's no penalty for delaying filing for part B. If you're going to file for part A, though, this filing timely, you can still do it, but double check with them. You don't have a health savings account here, so you don't have to worry. But there are some companies that do, and it is important. Not because of Medicare won't care about this, but it does matter for somebody who is on a health savings account because of how that's handled with the IRS and the company. So if you don't have a health savings account, ignore that. This is one of those like little lawyer's disclaimers so you're giving the right information because we don't want somebody to race out because they're filing uh, for benefits just like Patty do, do it and then they find out, oops, that wasn't the best idea. That's the only reason for telling you a disclaimer. 20 more employees, they're covered by an employer group health plan, you can delay. There's no penalty. So at the time when you stop, he'll stop, he'll contact us. Yes? HR here indicated to me that as long as I am still working and yep. covered by the group employee plan, yep. I don't need to apply for Medicare. Right. But they indicated that I probably should call Social Security and tell them that I'm still working, that I'm not applying for Medicare yet. I mean, do I need to do that? Well, the only, it's a good, the, you don't have to contact us. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. No one needs to contact us necessarily. The reason that for checking okay, Why the, would I do that? Well, if you're 66 and you want cash benefits, even if you're working. I'm 65. Okay. So, I wasn't. No, that's okay. You didn't have to show. That's but that was okay. Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> like, no, I had someone say that that's once and she was mortified. Like, I'm not going to answer that question. So, anyway. No, I mean, it is. Well, it is a meaningful yes. question. Yes. yes. You, you definitely don't have to contact us, but if you're not going to, you really want to, see the key is, do you want to file for Part A? Not right now. Then you can delay it. I'm covered yeah. by my but employer. oftentimes, the reason for asking about calling the 1-800 number, mm -hmm. for example, giving it, is to go over, because I always am a little careful saying, don't worry about it, mm -hmm. are there some specifics in your situation right. Widows, benefits, survivors' benefits, the question that your current spouse for delayed retirement credits. So the reason for having you do it is not for one specific, oh, yes, you have to tell them, but something comes up, and they what they'll do is look on the earnings record. The other reason sometimes is you want to contact us because so someone can break, look on the earnings record and make sure everything's correct. So when you do file for cash benefits, okay. everything's all right. So they're not wrong. Okay. There's just a difference in you don't have to, okay. and if you've checked all of this, that's fine. It's a good idea to make sure right. because of the various situations. When we were talking about the widows, for example, okay. something like that. And that's why the, the idea of contacting is just to make sure, do I need to do anything else? The other reason, though, and this is the real kick, is HR isn't Social Security. Right. So if tomorrow this changes to six months or four months, four changes completely, mm -hmm. they're not, they're in lag time, they're not going to know that because they can't possibly know. So the reason oftentimes you're referred to, say, our agency or Medicare, is not for a specific one, but on the possibility that this change, this thing that I'm talking about, HSA, one day showed up on our website and there was like a little tiny memo. We get hundreds of memos. When I get back, my email will be clogged with stuff. I'm that, that that will take me two hours to get through, trying to keep up with all these transmittals and all this information. This thing, because these change, this wasn't around before, and it's a spinoff from the, the Congress. They, they hadn't even thought about this when they, they, they did this, because the law had been set forever. No one even considered it when they were talking about health savings and what, what are competing interests. So the reason for sending you to us oftentimes is to get the most up-to-date information. And that's why it's worthwhile giving a phone call on that to go through, say I'm doing this, that I'm, and have them go through the spiel because something might come up. So that's the reason. It's, it's oftentimes you get sent, it's kind of vague. You go, well, why am I being sent? Because they, there's no way they can keep up with something that we just got yesterday. And 
and that's why you're always double checking to make sure. This is why these are important to, to continually do them. So my feeling would be, yeah, it's a good idea to do it. You don't have to. It doesn't hurt you. If you sign up for Part A, right, and yeah. you're still working here, and you happen to go into the hospital, what, is there a pecking order that? You're, you've uh, chosen your employer group health plan. They are going to be primary. One of the reasons people do not sign up for Part B is that Part B is not a typical co-insurance. They pay in place of. Right. They don't pay in addition to. No, so if you have an employer, if you have a comprehensive health plan that covers everything, generally you're not going to see a lot of additional coverage for Medicare. That isn't with everyone. Like, let, let me qualify this immediately. I'm taking, when I say it's comprehensive, this is a vague, warm and fuzzy comment, and you've got all of these plans. Some things are covered, some are not. And so oftentimes the suggestion is file for Part A if it turns out there's a shortfall. If you have a reasonably comprehensive plan, in most cases you might never use A, you might never use B, which is why they say, in most cases you won't. If you've got an 80% coverage and Medicare's not, remember they said 80% of the outcome. They don't pay 80% and then look for the additional 20. They say, we would have paid 80%, 80% is covered, we're now done. You don't do anything. But there are companies out there that actually only cover 40% or 60%, in which case it is in their interest to file for Part B and uh, making sure that they have A and B in the coverage. So as opposed to you where you might not have to file at all, someone else, they better have both of them because they really do need that as their primary. So that, that always depends on your particular plan. Generally, you've chosen your employer group health plan as your primary, I say generally. In this case, you will have chosen it, and therefore they do everything. There might be something useful for Medicare Part A, but it's down the road, and in a lot of cases, it, so that's why we always say, if you want to file, it's fine, because they might, that. but the might isn't with a big capital M, because you've got, you notice with like the Medigap plans with 49 of them, check them with all the employers. So there's no way you can say, you should do it, file, and you shouldn't. And then we have a health savings account, in which case you definitely should not. So we don't get involved in that. So the reason for keeping hands off is because we're getting into territory we don't handle. Once again, you're into the medical questions. We do with the enrollment, but we don't do with how comprehensive is comprehensive. You make that, you know. Go ahead, do you have a final question? Uh, well, actually two, but okay. um, somebody else has one. Um, so I'm thinking, Retirement in say a little more than a year. At what point should I file for both of these for Social Security and for Medicare? Well, in, in two, it, depending if on I, what if you're I'm going, looking at September 2013. Okay. And two I to three want, months before you want the cash benefit. Okay. Because I don't want to lapse. Or anything. Right. Okay. And see, what's going to happen is because you're on the employer group health plan. Right. Remember, you're, you're going to have to bring the form back. We will get the proof that says, basically, you were covered under your employer group health plan here, which means you ought to contact two, three months. One, just to make sure that we've got all the information. When I say about necessary filing, you might not need something else. There's something additional. Um, you want to make sure you get your payment into the bank as quickly as possible or into your investment firm, wherever you're sending it. The Medicare card has to be mailed to you from a vendor. So you want to make sure that we've got the information. So this would go back to, do they come to you to do this for the uh, for Medicare Part B? When someone is on your, your employer group health plan, they're not going to file for Part B. They come to HR directly, or do you go through a different benefits? No, once they would file for Part B, and then once they got their cards, they would bring them in to us so we can record the information. They don't have to do right, but they but but for the person who's on the employer group health plan, they have to have a form completed by our office. Do you complete that, don't you? Right. It's what I thought, and I've been doing. I was kind of glib earlier. I should have asked Vicki about that. I apologize. That's what I thought that was it. So you would come back, hand it a form, be dutifully completed, or you mail it to us, whatever. We have to establish that you were covered. You know, the important thing you were helping. This is when it ends. This is when it ends. Right. So the cash benefit is separate from the health benefit right. in that you're choosing when you receive that, and it'll be second, third, or fourth Wednesday. What month? I want to start receiving benefits. I want to start. I want to start as of January. Oh, okay. Then we'll begin second week in February, second Wednesday. The issue of the health plan 
that's where you have to establish that. So that's why if you want to both at the same time, just be aware when do you actually want Medicare Part B to begin. And as soon as you sign up with this, you're going to be telling us, oh, by the, remember, you only have the eight months. From the, so you're going to stop work when? Probably a year, September next year. Probably. Okay, so Probably. September. Well, it, we're making it up. So it's September. So sometime, say July, you want to contact us, or June, to start talking about, I want to file. You can do it online. Uh, you know, you can make a phone appointment or do it in person. And they'll get the form out to you. As soon as they take the interview, they're going to be sending that thing to you anyway. And then it comes here. But notice there's a lot of time. We mail you something. You have to get you to sign it. You have to go back and hand it to us. We have to process it. All the while, we can do the cash benefit, but the Medicare is an additional step. So, yeah, they're together, but in terms of the time sequence, you've got to get on it. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So it sounds like if you're covered on your company's medical plans, say, and you turn 65, you should not take Part B because you're going to be paying into that, and that's not necessary because you have your medical plan from your company. But Part A, hospitalization, you don't pay extra for that, and that would be like a backup to your company. For many people, plan. yes, and that's why they sign up for it. If you don't have to worry about a health savings account, sign up for it. It's, it's just there as a backup. You've got it. You've already paid for it. There are no penalties in having it. You'll get a Medicare card, but it will only say Part A, hospital insurance, and under certain conditions, depending on the plan, sometimes that's useful. So that's why good idea to think about filing for it, especially because you don't have health savings accounts. It doesn't hurt you to apply to get it. No one's going to hunt you down if you don't file for that. And there's no penalty financially to you as far as Social Security and Medicare is concerned. Whether it's useful or not, that has to do with the plan. So that's why the suggestion is, if you don't have a health savings or the, uh, uh, the, the Archer is a basically self-employed medical savings account, if you don't have that, sign up for Part A at least. You've got it. Ideally, it will be helpful. At worst, it's neutral. Whereas not doing it, maybe there will be a penalty down the road. It's, it, it's not a penalty for Part A, but in terms of your own private choices with your health plan, you'll say, gee, I wish I'd had the Medicare because they might have covered something. But that's the question. Might have covered question mark after it. Because in most cases, you won't, but in some cases you do. I'm, I'm sorry for being so vague, but it all depends on the health plan. So that's why the suggestion is, if you don't have the HSA or MSA, apply. And if you're only applying for Medicare, Part A, you can do it online, and it does take about 15 minutes. Really, it's that simple. Because you're not filing for cash benefits. We're not asking dozens of questions. They're very simple. And when you get to the point that says, do you want Medicare Part B? No, in your remarks, I'm under an employer group health plan. You're done. You stated it, you're done. It really is that simple. Very easy. Yes? Uh, follow up to her question. Sure. All right, age 65, you're going to retire at 66. Okay. You say, yeah, you know, okay, I'll take your advice, I'll register, I'll, I'll apply for part A. Now you're in, you know, you have some, you're hospitalized for some problem. And then, you know, even with our insurance, they say, do you have supplemental, you know, another insurance policy? So if you put down Medicare or A, how do those benefits get paid between, does Medicare step in at all, or do they come in after our primary? And I think They're you know, way at the end. Okay. The, the final thing, your mantra should always be, whether you file for A or not, if you have an employer group health plan, because it comes up all the time, some will ask, some provider will ask dutifully, and they do their job, are you on Medicare? The person goes, yeah, gives them the card. Next thing you know, Medicare gets a bill for like the physicians or something. Of course, you're not even, now Medicare is coming back trying to figure out what's going on. And now your private health plan can't figure out, why did it go there? It, it, yes, because somebody has referenced, we sent it to Medicare for Part B. So your mantra is always, it's it's my employer group health plan is my primary. It's my primary. <laughs> well, I, just say, right. I think you mentioned yes. that before, but I, I, yes. just yes. knowing yes. how hospitals Well, see, that it, it's one of the problems. Because there's yes. problems when you're not on. Uh, it's yeah. always, and in fact, as an aside, it is why some people, now see, this is a logistics question. Some people say, I don't even want to sign up for Part A because I could potentially have 
somebody makes a mistake and sends the bill when they've, they've done well. And so I can't go into that because the fact is that's, that's one of those areas where in real life is it in your interest. The point is, if you can use it, sign up for it. But yes, every time you sign up for any of the things, I want to mention one thing because we're, we're finished on this. If you sign for, if you are enrolled in cash benefits, so you filed at 62 or 3 or 4, you're enrolled in Medicare automatically, A and B. If you're on the employer group health plan, or your spouse is in this case, you can always send back the card with B. You can never send back A. You can't absent yourself from A saying, I don't want A, once you've actually filed for cash benefits. So in your instance, when you said, can I file for Medicare? Are you filing for cash benefits? No. You can isolate it to Medicare. So you can do that and then come back later and get cash benefits. But if you sign up for cash benefits, even though you say I don't want B, you have to sign up for A, which is somewhat curious. It's to protect people originally, but it becomes this kind of clumsy thing now because we have all these little strategies with health savings accounts and do I want to file and when do I want to put on. Generally, you want to be signing up for Medicare Part A. But I, it would be a lie to say you have to. You do not have to. If you never showed up for Medicare at all, that's your choice. Now, when you do, for Part B, if you're not an employer, you're going to get penalized. But no one's going to hunt you down. Once you're enrolled, though, then you're on for Part A and perhaps Part B. Again. So different questions to just be aware. So yes, you can always have those. I hear that all the time. People have horror stories about, I gave them it. I thought they knew that it was Part A, but they should do my employer development. I can't offer you anything other than that mantra because, yes, I've had people say that to me. On the other hand, if you can use A and you don't have it, you can't use it. So this is a, one of those issues of which is best for you. Most people have signed up for it, never use it or rarely use it, but sometimes do use it, depending again on your health plan. It's an option. It is a choice. No, but we do want to get you to at least go on the website, look at the thing. If possible, apply for Part A, because you don't have to worry about health savings accounts. The logistical question you have, and the practical question of how people can tend to get everything confused, I can't help you on that, because you're right, that there's always that potential. On the other hand, if you can use Part A for something, perhaps that it, it's a balance. You just have to be very, very careful. Same as with all of these. You just have to be very, very careful. And yes. Okay, the prescription drug program, private prescription drug plans, Medicare Advantage plans. If you're already covered by your employer, so again, Medicare handles all of this. We only have a short piece. But the fact is, if, you're, if you have what's called creditable insurance, and your employer, I know you have that, for prescription drugs, and do they continue afterwards when they retire? Correct. I haven't been here recently. The last time it was, yes. So that's why I just, I don't want to be too blue about this. You can stay on that, as long as you're on that prescription drug plan, you don't have to sign up because your employer will give you a letter that says, it's creditable insurance, you're covered. If it stops here, or if you were with an employer where you weren't covered, you would have to file for the prescription drug plan because similar to Medicare Part B, there's a penalty for not applying for the prescription enrolling in the Medicare prescription drug plan D. I do want to mention, because we talked about the website, the Medicare website is really good and get you for it. If you are looking for, in this case you probably won't, but if you know someone who's looking for Medicare prescription drug coverage, and they're not sure because they have a lot of medicines and they're, okay, what do I do with all these medications? The plans that are around that have been worked out with Medicare, because they have, they know who's got it, they all, Medicare also has been formed with the formula. That you can actually find out what are the top 100 drugs they have in their formulary, how much the premiums are. It is a good website. You can actually plug it in. You need patience because it will do like a top five. So you have three medications, bump, bump, bump. What did you take? How much? Da -da -da -da. It takes a couple of minutes to complete it. But it will come back and give you these are the plans that are lowest cost, or are these the ones that have all these specific medications, you want the brand, and that sort of thing. So it's a very, very good site. All of that goes through now. Um, you contact Medicare um, on the, either through the phone on its 1-800-Medicare or um, on their web uh, site, 
very good dough for plants, and we'll go over this. The one thing just to be aware of, you have prior, these private prescription drug plans are standalone plans. They just covered drugs. You're similar to that through what you probably have here. Medicare Advantage plans are package deals, so all your hospital, medical, and prescription drugs. So if you go on to look for plans, before you do anything else, you have to know that you want an HMO that's going to cover everything because the, you get a package deal, or do you, you already have hospital and medical, you just want a standalone plan all by itself that only handles prescription drugs because you're two different categories, and they have lists of each one of the companies in each one. So you have to kind of think ahead of time, which one do you want? Do you like this, or do you, you like what you have? You just are adding prescription drug plan. And this goes back to if you're a caregiver or family members, anything like this. So the first thing you have to do is be looking at that. But the Medicare website, at that point, the Medicare website actually breaks out. Here are the standalone plans. Here are the Medicare Advantage. What you look for, and you can go through. I don't mean to imply that you have to choose one versus the other. I'm just saying when you're looking for them at first, here are all the standalone plans. You have to be aware how they set up. Here's the Medicare Advantage stuff. Very, very well done. Nicely broken out on the system. And finally, this is our website, socialsecurity.gov. Again, retirement, the near retirement question mark. All of our top services, so if you apply online, the estimator, uh, there are, uh, there's extra help. Once you're on, you can, in fact, get a replacement Medicare card. You can change your address. Uh, you can get passwords, so you can do things like direct deposit. It's all available here. So do suggest that you please explore it. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful day, and it is not raining, so it's a good day. Thank you. Thank you. It's like party. Uh,